PowerPoint. And let's go through some practice questions. So my goals for this PowerPoint, I already gained a little bit of experience with the content, which you guys have been studying in depth diligently, um, but just exposed to a few more ideas. Practice test taking strategies and then practice some clinical reasoning related to different PT areas. So I know um, being in orthopedic residency, I'm a little more biased towards orthopedics. That's a good portion of your exam, so lucky for that. Um, but it probably isn't completely comprehensive. In other words, there are areas that are not on here, but this was kind of, in my mind, I tried to make it a decent smattering of questions to get you think about different body areas, MSK, a little bit of neuro in there, um, and some other sections. So here we go. Um, little quick disclaimer. So uh, I know you don't expect this, but none of this information, none of these questions is taken from the 2019 board exams. So um, that's illegal. I wouldn't talk about it. Nothing is reproduced from that. Um, nor are any of these questions taken verbatim from any textbooks. So though my studying was guided by textbooks and deep sea education, just as yours will be, uh, none of these questions has been directly uh, plagiarized or taken out. So I'm not giving credit because they're not exact questions. So came up with them on my own. They are going to look very similar to questions on these different resources just because I wanted to preserve the flavor of the questions that you might see that are common as practice questions for MPT. So they are verbatim, but some of them may be very similar or maybe consistent with principles that you see on your practice test. Um, but I just want you to know I'm not directly copying questions from anywhere. So just so you know. All right. So here's what I did is I'm going to give you maybe a minute to look at these questions and kind of come up with your best answer. If you're following along to the PowerPoint, one thing you can do is if you look at the slide, then that will give you a chance to answer. In the notes section will be the correct answer. And then what I've also done is added a bonus question so that we get practice on a related concept. So we can really think through these different concepts in depth and get some practice digging into some of the learning points or material versus just focusing on did I get that question right or wrong, which is really, I think, how you should be and how probably you are studying this material is to take your practice tests and review those questions with the intent of learning how it can guide your decision making um, versus necessarily getting too awful focused on what did I get right, what did I get wrong. Obviously, you want to get enough right to pass and you want to get enough right to feel like you're making progress on those practice tests, but really using each question as kind of a learning experience. So, okay, so for this first question, uh, and if you wanna follow along um, on our discussion by going to the notes, the other thing I tried to do is for those bonus questions is put the question up there and then put the answer far enough down so that you, have, so that you can answer it without seeing it so that you're really having to scroll down to see if you guys are seeing my screen. So there's the question and the answer is gonna be at the bottom, okay. So you don't have to view that if you don't want to. So it gives you some freedom in how you use this. So, all right, what position would you expect to have the greatest amount of force generated when using a handheld, when using a handheld dynamometer, is what that should say, or dynamometry, dynamometer, dynamometer. Well, I'm gonna have to fix that. For a five position grip strength test, or five position grip strength testing. Position one, position three, position four, position five. So the best answer on this one is position three. And what we're looking at is in this test of grip strength, um, the five position grip strength test is to test grip strength at different widths of grip. With the idea being that at a different grip width, you should have a different length tension relationship of those gripping muscles, finger flexors primarily. Um, to facilitate or that length tension relationship then is going to give you the ability to generate more force at different positions or more force 
at a different leg tension place in that muscle. Um, so the person who came up with this test, uh, or who first described it, used it as a way to test whether individuals were truly presenting with musculoskeletal mechanical pain or whether they were faking, whether they were malingering. He said, if you test in these five different positions, you should have what looks more like a bell-shaped curve of strength. People who are faking or who aren't giving their best effort on this test are saying, ow, 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 that hurts. Oh, ow, 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 that grips, that width hurts too. Ow, ow, ow. And they're just not giving good effort are going to have what looks more like a flat curve in which there's no variation between the different widths or the positions. So what we'd expect based on the length tension relationship and some of the data that's been gathered, and this is just something you have to know, I don't know how you deduce this, is that the strongest positions will be in position, um, strongest positions will be in position two and position three. So the second and third positions of that test should be the peak of that bell curve, if that makes sense. Um, position two is not on here, so position three, that's our best answer for highest strength. Um, bonus question or related question is, if we're thinking about low back pain, somebody comes in with low back pain, and I never want to encourage people to think about patients as malingering. In fact, I don't have any patients that I think are faking. Everybody who comes in, I believe them. They have real pain um, until proven otherwise. But as we try to learn these tests that are described in the literature to help guide our decision making, we want to know about these things just in case. So um, at the lumbar spine, there's been a series of tests that have described or findings that have been used to describe a potential malingering patient. And those uh, signs and symptoms have been described by. Waddell, and so they're often called Waddell signs, and the acronym to remember them is T-R-O-D-S, and so I'll let you look up that acronym and think through those different tests um, as far as mal malingering goes. Okay, so that's our first question. Question two, you are I'll give you a minute to read this. I kind of do the same thing. I'll give you a minute to read this and then um, we'll come back together. All right, so you're evaluating a patient with neck pain and you notice that during active range of motion testing, they have limited right side bend and they're limited in left rotation. So in order to be more certain whether this is due to limitation at the upper cervical spine, so OA joint or C12, AA joint, or lower cervical spine, C2 through C7 joints, you decide to perform which further assessment technique. So upper trap muscle length testing, cervical CPA, cervical flexion rotation test, or cervical quadrant testing. Um, best answer here would be number three, cervical flexion rotation test. And the reason for that, if you're following along in the notes, is that the observed pattern of dysfunction is side bend limited opposite rotation. That is oftentimes described as contralateral coupling or a dysfunction of um, the upper cervical spine, whereas the lower cervical spine, C2 through C7, if joints are affected in that lower cervical spine, what you might expect to see is the opposite pattern, in which case right side bend is limited and right rotation is limited. Um, but if you see that opposite pattern or contralateral coupling, that will lead you to suspect uh, upper cervical spine involvement 
And so now what we want to do is look through the answers to try to see if we can figure out which tests out of those tests that are named specifically test the upper cervical spine. So answer one, upper trap muscle length testing. Well, we're not testing joints, we're testing muscle length. So in fact, upper trap tightness, though it may restrict side bending and opposite rotation, uh, in the question itself, we're, we're trying to differentiate between upper and lower cervical spine joint dysfunction so that muscle testing doesn't make sense. So one's not a great answer. Cervical CPA is with the patient in prone. So cervical CPA, um, patient face down. So I'm doing PA pressure is going to test the um, facet joints, bilateral facet joints. Um, and I could do CPAs from, I'm not going to do CPAs on C1, but I could do C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7. But that's not really going to help me differentiate between the AA joint um, and lower cervical. It might tell me like regionally where that individual is tender. It might give me a sense for hypomobility, whether it's higher or lower, but it's not the best answer. If there's nothing else that's good, we might come back to it. But in my mind, I'm like, ah, uh, doesn't quite do it for me. Cervical flexion rotation tests, specifically bringing them into full cervical flexion and then testing rotation is a test specifically designed to look at upper cervical mobility um, and bias AA motion. So that test is starting to look very good because that test specifically looks at upper cervical mobility. And that'll kind of give us a sense for whether that's where the limitation exists, which is what our hypothesis is based on the contralateral coupling. Cervical quadrant testing is combined extension side bend or rotation. So you're looking at different quadrants of motion and quadrant testing is typically used to differentiate between um, spinal facets. So facet dysfunction will oftentimes be painful and limited in your posterior extension quadrants versus a disc might be painful and limited in your anterior flexion quadrants and you might get a sense for whether right or left is affected more but again it doesn't really differentiate between upper and lower cervical so best choice we're going with three cervical flexion rotation tests um related question would be how would you perform muscle length assessment on the upper trap versus levator scapula so if you think about how you would stretch these different muscles um you would i realize i'm doing these motions and you can't see me on the screen you're just watching my powerpoint so i just realized that um, so as you're stretching the upper trap and levator, um, you're remembering that upper trap is going to have a pattern of dysfunction of side bending away and rotating towards is going to stretch that muscle versus levator. You're going to side bend away and rotate away. And that would be your muscle stretch or muscle length assessment. So if you're differentiating between muscle restriction, thinking about how to differentiate between those two muscles might be important. Okay, question three. I'll give you a second on this one. All right, so you're evaluating a patient with a diagnosis of patellofemoral pain syndrome. During functional testing of a double leg squat, you notice that the patient demonstrates increased hip adduction internal rotation, knee valgus, and pronation in their symptomatic lower extremity. You decide that this is likely due to muscle weakness in these muscles. Um, glute max and glute med, glute med and posterior tib, posterior tib and TFL, or glute med and TFL. So as you're looking through these answer choices, starting to think about weakness patterns that are common if you were to see this biomechanical fault of 
hip, so knees caving in, arch of the foot collapsing in colloquial terms. Um, and we're starting to think about weak hip abductors and probably also if you're addressing the foot and ankle, some sort of weakness of the muscles that control or stabilize the arch. So in foot intrinsics or arch stabilizing muscles. Um, primarily, as we're thinking about a muscle that eccentrically controls pronation and concentrically controls supination, posterior tibialis. Other thing we started to think about is out of our hip abductors, what are the secondary motions that those hip abductors tend to facilitate based on their line of pull? So gluteus medius is gonna be an abductor, but it's also gonna have a little moment of external rotation versus TFL as an abductor is gonna be an internal rotator of the hip. So if I have muscle weakness where I'm defaulting into an adducted position, adducted, and I'm defaulting into internal rotation, the weakness at that muscle group um, is likely going to be in the opposite direction. So starting to think about that. So based on those decision-making justifications, what I'm really looking for in this question is weakness in number one, probably glute med, and number two, if there's a contributor from the foot and ankle, probably post tib. And that's what we find. So glute med and post tib is number two, and that's gonna be the best, the best answer. Sorry, I'm gonna switch back over and let, let a couple people in here. Okay. All right, so back to this. So again, hopefully that decision-making makes sense. Um, TFL could be a possible answer, but I think I've tried to explain why that's not the best answer. Um, glute max, primarily hip extender, so we wouldn't expect that. And if we pick glute meat and TFL, we're not really addressing possible contribution of foot and ankle. Um, what treatments would you use to treat this impairment? What types of cues might you utilize? I'll let you guys look at that one um, on your own. Moving on to question four. Okay, I'll give you a second to read this one. Okay, so you're evaluating a 57-year-old female with upper back pain. She's a former smoker. She has low BMI. Um, her PMH includes hypertension, corticosteroid use, and thyroid use, or sorry, thyroid dysfunction, not thyroid use. During your exam, she has significant tenderness to palpation at T9 spinous process. You're concerned about a compression fracture due to these factors that increase risk of spinal fracture. And then there are some different factors listed. Uh, one more person in here. Um, so the different factors out of these that we're thinking of, which do you think increase risk of fracture? So this question is getting at, do you know the list of risk factors or factors that increase risk of spinal fracture or compressor fracture specifically? Um, when we're thinking about spinal fracture, it's going to be more common in the thoracic spine, so upper back. So that's consistent with her presentation. Um, what we know is, uh, is that these factors that tend to increase risk are um, female, greater than 50 years old, um, history of trauma, point tenderness at a, the spinous process, and then the fifth one is corticosteroid use for the reason that 
corticosteroids tend to be catabolic or they tend to break down tissues. Um, and this is kind of across tissues. So they tend to be catabolic of tendon, ligament, muscle, and bone. And in this case, we're thinking bone. But that's why if you think about people getting corticosteroid injections, there's a limit to how many they recommend some would, somebody will receive in a year because of the potential catabolic uh, effects on tissues or deleterious effects. So if we're looking for those risk factors, a combination of those risk factors that show up in this question, the best answer is going to be answer number one. Um, former smoker, yeah, it's not going to help her health. It's not going to help her bone health, but it doesn't fit in that CPR. So that's an easy distractor. You might think smoker, yeah, it's not good for healing, it's not good for bone health, and you're right, but it doesn't make the list of those risk factors. So that's a hard one, I know, I apologize, but you gotta make it a little bit hard. Um, low BMI is gonna contribute to risk for other bone disorders. In fact, the bonus question is based on this, but again, it doesn't put her at greater risk for fracture per se, but does put her at greater risk for an associated condition, which um, again, she's at risk for, and that might be worth screening before you do joint mobilization manipulations. And I think we're all thinking it. So low bone mineral density, osteoporosis or osteopenia, she kind of fits the stereotypical picture for that. And so the tricky thing about this question, I think is differentiating between what factors put her at risk for low bone mineral density osteoporosis, osteopenia versus which factors are very specific to increasing risk for spinal fracture. Okay. Question five. Um, all right, here we go. We got a non-orthopedic one. If you're not an orthopedic person, you're thinking, finally, thank goodness. Okay, so working in an outpatient neuro PT clinic. Um, and I'm gonna start going through these a little bit quicker just because we have a little bit more limited time. We'll see if we can get through all of them. Um, but I'll try to give you a chance to at least read them as I read the question and think, think through it a little bit, but not quite as much time. So uh, working in outpatient neuro, you get a PT order to evaluate and treat a patient who suffered a left hemisphere um, CVA or stroke. Uh, in the order, it states that the patient has right hand weakness and is also seen as speech language pathologist for speech impairment. So based on your knowledge of neuroanatomy, you suspect that this particular artery was involved. So um, common pattern with stroke is we see left hemisphere is affected, contralateral motor deficits. So that's consistent. Left hemisphere is affected, right hand weakness. Um, what we also want to remember as we're trying to differentiate artery affected is our, uh, we get right hand weakness. So we wanna re remember our motor homunculus and which arteries supply which portion of that homunculus. And then we also wanna remember which arteries are going to be supplying areas associated with speech and language. And that's maybe my best cheat for this question as you're starting to think about, so is it gonna be the right MCA? Well, we're told that it's in the left hemisphere. So we're thinking probably not right MCA. So that's an easy one to cross off. Um, left vertebral artery could be, but it's pretty nonspecific. And we have some really specific impairments that we were given. Um, okay. So those two aren't the best. Left MCA versus left ACA, ah, they're very similar, but which artery is gonna supply the motor homunculus that we're interested in? So remember, um, motor homunculus on the lateral hemisphere, if you kind of envision that little, little man or person kind of marching up and around, you're gonna start with, um, face, hand, arm, trunk is gonna be at the top of the lateral hemisphere. And then 
leg and foot is going to hang down into that medial hemisphere. And that's really going to be a nice way to remember the split of that homunculus is to think about where those different body parts are. And on that lateral hemisphere, um, that lateral hemisphere side of the cortex is primarily going to be supplied by the, by the middle cerebral artery. And so we're thinking MCA is most likely. So hand weakness, lateral hemisphere, part of the homunculus, MCA. The other thing that might help you out is that the middle cerebral artery is, has been nicknamed the language artery because it supplies that lateral hemisphere. And if you think about the language areas in the brain that we primarily talk about in PT, we know them by their eponyms or by the people that they're associated with. And we call them Broca's area and Wernicke's area, typically. And so those areas that are associated with speech function are on the lateral hemisphere. Because of that, and because the middle cerebral artery supplies those areas, it's been nicknamed the language artery. If you're trying to remember where these different arteries are, blood supply, that's kind of a nice trick. Um, okay. Related question are deficits associated with Broca's aphasia versus Wernicke's aphasia. And again, I'm going to let you go through that one on your own as a follow-up and check out the answer on that. But let's keep, let's keep going because I want to get through, yeah, I have 10 questions and bonus questions. So this next one, you're working with a patient in acute care PT setting who's just been admitted to the hospital and suffering from right congestive heart failure. Based on what you know about this condition, you expect to document these signs and symptoms as part of your evaluation of this patient. So we're thinking what signs and symptoms are consistent with um, right CHF? Um, I'm just gonna fix my spelling here. Okay. So when I think about right versus left CHF, I try to think about the functions of those different sides of the heart. So with um, right atrium and ventricle function, you're thinking about blood supply as it goes through the heart and pulmonary circulation, entering the right atrium, moving to the right ventricle um, before it's pumped to the lungs, left atrium, left ventricle, body, right? So that's kind of your circuit. Um, if blood comes into the right side of the heart and you have dysfunction on that right side of the heart, what's going to happen is that that blood is not going to be able to be moved properly through that circuit, and it's going to start backing up um, to the prior stage where it's coming from basically. And so if we're thinking about a right side of dysfunction, what that is going to back into is going to be the body. And so you're gonna have more body symptoms with right-sided heart failure versus left-sided heart failure as it backs up the prior stage in the, in the circulation or the circuit of that flow is gonna be the lungs. So you're gonna have pulmonary symptoms or pulmonary backup versus right side, we're thinking the backup is going to happen into the body. So it's going to push fluid back into the body because it can't process all of that fluid or venous blood that it's receiving if we're thinking about right side. So the symptoms are going to be consistent with body symptoms. So jugular venous distension, check, body symptom, increased fluid in the body's vascular supply. Lower extremity pitting edema, yep, we can't move as much fluid through. Um, wheezing and rails, that's more of a pulmonary sign and symptom. And so that might be more indicative of left-sided. So best answer on this one's gonna be number three, those body symptoms. So have some notes in the um, notes section to be consistent with that and then Going off of that, some signs and symptoms of low cardiac output for the left heart failure. And you can kind of look at those. So if you're not pumping enough blood out of the left side, what are your signs and symptoms going to be? Well, you're not getting enough blood supply to the brain, so you could have some neuro symptoms. 
động trả luôn nó 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 ba bữa ba đánh ba đánh ba động trả rồi mà nó All right, let's keep chugging. Question seven. So you're working with a patient who's under the care of a neurologist. He's recently been experiencing progressive bilateral low extremity weakness. He recently noticed some paresthesia in his groin and upper thigh area. He has a lumbar x-ray and an MRI already. Those have already been done. The neurologist has recommended further imaging. And the most likely technique that he is recommending is which one? A myelogram, a CT scan an arthrogram or an angiogram. So this question we're trying to get at, what are these different types of imaging and what do they tell us? So he already has an x-ray, already has an MRI. He's experiencing some kind of um, scary neuro symptoms. So we want some further testing, excuse me. Um, but what do we wanna, what do we suspect? What do we wanna really look at? Well. Uh, let's go through these imaging techniques and kind of see if we can knock some off. So lumbar myelogram, what is a myelogram? If you remember myelo, that prefix, that refers to spinal cord and gram just means a picture. You're breaking down the word. So picture of spinal cord. Yep, that might be useful. Um, that might give us some good information to check out these neurosymptoms. Lumbar CT, well, he already has an x-ray. CT is going to give us a little bit more clear image, but doesn't do much for soft tissue. Um, not my favorite answer. Lumbar arthrogram. What does the prefix arthro tell us? Well, arthrokinematics, uh, arthrogram. Arthro refers to joint. And is he having joint dysfunction? Not, not from what we can tell from his case study. We think he's having more of nervous tissue dysfunction. So we're not as interested in an arthrogram. We don't want to look at his facet joints per se. We really want to look at nervous tissue. So I don't like that answer. Uh, an angiogram of the thoracic and lumbar. Is he having vascular symptoms? So angio, referring to vessel or vasculature. So an angiogram, picture of the vessels of the thoracic and lumbar. Again, it's not my favorite answer. Um, what I really would like in this patient is an idea of if he's having spinal cord compression because he's exhibiting symptoms of myelopathy or spinal cord pathology. So yeah, let's get a picture of that spinal cord and see if there's something going on. So that'd be the best answer, I think. Um, myelogram, um, we'll give you some notes on that. So it's contrast enhanced, enhanced radiograph. That gives you, gives you a picture of those nervous structures. Uh, what type of neurologic disorder may suggest the use of an angiogram? So when are you going to want to visualize vessels? Well, we talked about stroke. Um, so that might be one indicated pathology. But what I was really getting at here is uh, a brain, brain aneurysm to really look at those vessels. All right. So a couple more minutes, a few more questions here. I think these... Last couple, pretty straightforward. So you're working with a pediatric patient. Let's see if we can get through these. Telling me I have four minutes. Okay, talk fast. Uh, you're working with a pediatric patient with Down syndrome. Out of these factors listed below, this is not a consideration. Um, I should read. This is confusing, sorry. This is not a consideration or precaution that you need to be aware of in order to most effectively help this patient in PT and keep them safe. Um, so low tone, greater risk for ligamentous stresses. Does that describe an individual with Down syndrome? Well, yeah, we know that Down syndrome tends to be a low tone. Um, that tends to be one of the presentations that we see. And so in certain positions, W sitting or extreme ranges of motion at joints that can cause ligamentous stress. So yeah, we want to be aware of that for somebody with Down syndrome. Increased risk of OA hypermobility. This is, again, one of the features of individuals with Down syndrome is that they are at risk for um, hypermobility at this joint. It's something we want to be careful with, and that's why we're, we have a contraindication to perform joint mobilizations in this area. I mean, we might want to check um, ligamentous stability in that area. Reduced ability to participate in sports. Well, don't really think so. So Down syndrome individuals may have developmental delay, but it doesn't mean that they can't participate in sports. May need some 
training or some adaptation, but it doesn't mean they can't be sports participants. So that one I don't really like. And then heart disorders, we do know that that's one complication of Down syndrome. So best intro on this one is number three, not really associated with Down syndrome. Uh, and then the test that you may perform to assess integrity of upper cervical spine, ligamentous integrity, I'll let you look at that one, but that's kind of related to OA. Okay. Question number nine. So you're evaluating a patient after a stroke, CVA, and you find that they're unable to detect vibration when applied to the right lateral form and upper arm. This deficit could be caused from damage to these areas. So no vibration sense from these places, upper extremity, right side. Um, what are you expecting is affected? So if you remember your sensory tracts, your primary sensory tracts, um, you're going to be thinking about dorsal column medial lemniscus system, which detects proprioception, vibration, <laughs> touch, um, light touch, versus your anterior lateral system, also known as your spinothalamic tract, which is going to communicate sensory information about um, not pain, don't say pain, nociception, temperature, mechanical pressure, and within, under the category of nociception, we know that includes chemical stimulus too. So vibration is the sense that's affected. So we're thinking dorsal column medial luminescus. It could be anywhere along that pathway. So it could be um, at the dorsal column, which we see in answer four. It could be at the thalamus, which we also see in answer four. So I'm liking that one. Um, and then where does that sensory data go? Well, the sensory data goes to the Remember, our in the back door, out the front. So sensory information is coming in the posterior side of the spinal cord, side of the brain. And motor information is coming out the front, anterior horn cells, precentral gyrus. So postcentral gyrus is going to be our sensory place. So that's any three parts of that system could be affected. So dorsal column, medial lumnesius, thalamus, or postcentral gyrus. So Based on those areas, number four is going to be the most likely. Precentral gyrus is motor, so I don't really like that. Um, anterior lateral system doesn't communicate vibration sense, so I don't like that answer. And then occipital lobe, we know primary visual sensory inputs, so I don't like that one. And then the bonus question starts getting you thinking about which sides of these tracks are affected and where does it decussate or where does it cross. So I'll let you go through that one on your own. Question number 10. See if we get through this, but I might get cut off. But thank you for joining me for this review. And um, again, this, this PowerPoint can be found on the Google Drive, so you can reference this on your own, go through the bonus questions. Uh, this last one, so you're treating 